During the hundreds of years spent studying the structure of matter, there have been a number of models of the atom that have developed over to understand the physical relationship between its positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons. There's still a lot we don't know, but current theories describe electrons in terms of quantum mechanics, waves, and probabilities. Fortunately, we don't need that level of complexity to study diodes and transistors, the semiconductor devices that we'll study this semester. For our purposes, we can think of the nucleus consisting of tightly bound, positively charged protons and electrically neutral neutrons. We can model electrons as being the negatively charged particles more widely dispersed around the nucleus that, along with protons and neutrons, form the atoms. The larger atoms possess more electrons, and the further we progress across and down the periodic table, the more electrons an atom has. For a number of reasons, some electrons are more tightly associated with the nucleus than others. The electrons that are less tightly held are freer to move about and are thus better able to flow through the material under the influence of externally applied voltage than electrons that are more tightly bound. When we classify materials according to their conductivity or their ability to carry a current, we typically talk about conductors and insulators. Conductors are made up of atoms with an abundance of loosely bound electrons, while insulators consist of atoms with tightly bound electrons. And in between is a group of materials, both atoms and molecules, that can be manipulated to act as either conductors or insulators. They are referred to as semiconductors. Generally speaking, the better conducting materials reside in the middle columns of the periodic table. The conductors we are most familiar with are found next to each other in, in the periodic table. Iron, nickel, copper, silver, and gold are among the best conductors that we typically are, or typically that are used. These elements are similar in electrical properties. Most other atoms tend to not conduct current very well and can be thought of as insulators. Practical insulators are frequently molecules made up of different types of atoms bound together such that the free electrons on one element have formed relatively stable strong bonds with the available electrons on the other types of atoms. Silicon dioxide is one such example that's used extensively as an insulator in transistors. Each silicon dioxide molecule consists of one silicon atom bound with two oxygen atoms. Other insulators are frequently made up from longer organic molecules like various types of plastics. But there is a group of atoms that exist just to the right of the metals that are known as semiconductors. Silicon, germanium, and more recently carbon have been particularly useful semiconductors. Much of the early work with transistors was done with, gera was done with germanium. Recently, organic semiconductors based upon chains of carbon atoms have found applications, but currently silicon is by far the most commonly used semiconductor, and our attention will focus on it. As we've noted, carbon, silicon, and germanium all exist in what is referred to as the 4A column of the periodic table. Carbon, silicon, and germanium. Their valence electron structure consists of two s orbital and two p orbital electrons. It turns out that there is a more stable molecular pa orbital pattern for these four valence electrons. The four hybrid sp4 molecular orbits are uniformly spaced about the atom at the corners of a tetrahedron. Although this is where the prob probabilities and quantum mechanics come in, we can think of this as one of the four valence electrons of each individual atom existing in each of these four hybrid molecular orbitals. Each of these atoms with its four unpaired electrons are available and are strongly drawn to create covalent bonds with other similar silicon atoms. Under the right circumstances, these atoms form large crystals of pure silicon. It is this crystalline silicon that serves as the substrate, the building materials for diodes and transistors. Although these bonds are stable and quite durable, thermal energy or heat causes a small percentage of these covalent bonds to break, freeing unbound negatively charged electrons and leaving behind a vacancy. 
In the absence of the electron, there is actually a localized positive charge left behind. These positively charged vacancies are referred to as holes. Over time, these thermally liberated electrons randomly move in a type of Brownian motion and reform bonds in other holes vacated by other electrons. Thus, a small percentage of the bonds are vacated at any given time. But an equilibrium is reached where the rate of hole formation equals the rate of recombination. The concentration of free electrons is frequently denoted with a lowercase letter n. The corresponding hole concentration is frequently designated with the letter p. The designator n sub i refers to the electron concentration in intrinsic silicon or undoped silicon or pure silicon. And at room temperature, the number of electrons will equal the number of holes, which we're calling n sub i, and it'll be on the order of 1.5 times 10 to the 10th electrons or holes per cubic centimeter. Compare this to silicon that has approximately 5 times 10 to the 22nd atoms per cubic centimeter. So clearly the number of covalent bonds that are broken is a very, very small percentage of the total number of bonds existing. The formula for calculating the, the uh, electron concentration in intrinsic silicon or intrinsic semiconductor, in this case is for, for silicon, was developed empirically and is given as this right here, where T is in degrees Kelvin, K is Boltzmann's constant in electron volts per degree Kelvin, and B is material specific uh, parameter, and for, for a silicon it's 5.4 times 10 to the 31st power. Up until now we've been talking about intrinsic or pure silicon. The process of exchanging the electrical or changing the electrical properties of a semiconductor by replacing a relatively small number of, of uh, silicon atoms in the crystal structure with atoms of other carefully selected elements is known as doping. So we're representing here that a silicon atom has been replaced by a boron atom. These substitute elements are known as dopants. Generally, the dopant elements come from either the 3A or the 5A column of the periodic table. These are the columns that fall on either side of the 4A column. Elements in the 3A column, just to the left of the 4A column, contain only three valence electrons. When they displace a silicon atom, one covalent bond is missing an electron, and a hole is formed. So an electron with a, the boron has only three valence electrons, and the vacancy left by there being one fewer electrons is what we're going to refer to as a hole. But this silicon atom here has an electron that's unbound with a boron there. This type of dopant is referred to as p-type dopant or acceptor dopant because at that location in the crystal structure there's an unformed bond that will accept an electron to complete the bond. On the other side of the 4A column, elements in the 5A column just to the right of the 4A column contain five valence electrons, or one more needed, one more than needed for the four possible covalent bonds with silicon. When they displace a silicon atom in the lattice, there's an extra free electron that remains unpaired. Un uh, so for example, we've got a phosphorus dopant here that is displaced one silicon atom in the crystal structure. The phosphorus has five covalent electrons, four of them pair with the silicon electrons, and one is left unpaired and is free. This type of dopant is referred to as n-type or donor dopant. It's important to keep in mind that these holes in electrons are localized. Each atom is still electrically neutral. There are just as many negatively charged electrons as positively charged protons with each atom. There is no net charge. The hole simply represents a vacancy in a covalent bond, and a free electron simply means there was no covalent bonding location for it to fill. One of the most challenging parts of this part of the class is just keeping the terminology and variable names straight. 
Here's a brief list of the most important terms thus far. Lowercase n represents the concentration of free electrons. Lowercase p represents the concentration of holes. n sub n represents the concentration of free electrons in an n-doped semiconductor. Under these circumstances, the free electrons in the n-doped are referred to as a majority carrier. The majority of the carriers in n-type or n-doped semiconductor will be electrons. P sub n is the concentration of holes in the n-doped semiconductor. Thermal combination recombination tells us that there will be a small number of holes existing at, it, it, at any given time, even though the semiconductor is doped with n-type dopant, which means there's plenty of free electrons um, floating around, if you will. But the holes in an n-type semiconductor are referred to as a minority carrier. N sub p is the concentration of electrons in p-doped semiconductor. So in a p-doped semiconductor, you've got more holes than electrons, but again, due to thermal, the thermal activity, um, holes will be formed and free electrons will exist even though the majority carriers in that semiconductor will be um, holes. And so electrons that exist in the p-type semiconductor will be the minority carrier. Finally, P sub P refers to the concentration of holes in p-doped semiconductor. And in those circumstances, the holes in the p-doped semiconductor will represent the majority carrier. So you have majority and minority carriers in both types of, of doped semiconductors. Holes are the minority carrier in a p-type, or holes are a minority carrier in an n-type doped semiconductor. And electrons are the majority carrier in an n-type semiconductor. And in p-type semiconductors, the holes are the majority carrier and the electrons are the, mon are the, are the minority um, charge carriers. Two final terms. Capital N sub D refers to the donor concentration. It's the concentration of dopant that has been, has been placed into the semiconductor. Now, generally speaking, the dopant concentration will be much greater than the intrinsic concentration on the order of 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 15th times as great, depending upon the doping concentrations. So generally speaking, in n-doped semiconductors, n sub n, the number of electrons, the number of electrons, the concentration, not the number, but the concentration of electrons in the n-doped semiconductor will be closely approximated by the doping concentration or the donor concentration. So N sub D is the donor concentration. N sub A is the acceptor concentration in a p-type dopant. It's the concentration of, of um, acceptor or p-type dopant that has been injected into or placed into the silicon substrate in the p-type area. Once again, typically speaking, N sub A, the donor concentration of dopant will be significantly greater than the intrinsic value. So the concentration of holes in a p-type semiconductor will be very close to the dopant concentration, the p-type dopant concentration in the p-type semiconductor.